Okay. It's always interesting trying to make all this stuff work up here. All right, so last class, we were talking about earthquakes, and one of the effects of earthquakes that we're going to spend a little time on, and we started talking about this last class, was uh, tsunamis, uh, which is the Japanese term for harbor waves. And unlike normal waves that are out in the ocean that are caused by the wind, harbor waves result from land displacement. Typically that's done by earthquakes. Earthquakes shifting land in the ocean floor causing waves above it. Sometimes they can result from landslides going into the ocean. That's land displacement as well. And there's been several well-known tsunamis that have resulted from that. But for the most part, Tsunamis form when we have pretty large magnitude seven-ish earthquakes that occur offshore that results in large sections of the ocean floor being disrupted and the water above it being displaced in the form of tsunamis. And I'll show you some diagrams and videos today of not only how these things form, but some of the devastation that results from them as well. So I found a slightly better um, video that I can show you about how tsunamis typically form. It'll take me a minute to switch computers here. Or not. Let's see. Oh, and lovely. And every time this happens, it gets rid of everything I had up here. So, give me just a minute, please. Spend all this time setting it up. There we go. Let's see.
An earthquake created an estimated 600 mile rupture on the ocean floor. This caused a tsunami to form and then travel at the speed of a jetliner, reaching over 11 countries, traveling over 3,000 miles, killing more than 220,000 people. Because they can strike so quickly with such deadly force, tsunami warning centers around the globe are on constant alert monitoring underwater earthquakes large enough to trigger massive waves. Their ultimate goal is to alert vulnerable coastlines and give residents time to see higher ground before a tsunami hits. Okay, there's a couple things in there I don't know if you actually noticed. Um, one is that... I'll turn that off in a second, sorry. One thing I've always found interesting about tsunamis is that they're so damaging and they can strip off so many things off of land, including buildings, cars, various structures. And I don't know if you saw, there's actually fire on top of the tsunami, which doesn't seem like it should happen, but it can. Did you have a question? Yeah, the thank you, appreciate that. All right, let's see if I can make this work now. Of course not. Okay, hang on just a second. Nothing's gonna be easy today. Okay, again, my apologies. All right, so, the one point I'm trying to make with tsunamis right now is that these are really different than the waves that you typically get out in the ocean that are caused by wind. You know, if you've ever been out on the ocean for any length of time, you see lots of waves. And the waves can be small, the waves can be big, but the vast majority of those waves that you see are simply caused by the winds that blow across the ocean surface. Tsunamis have a different origin. It's caused by land displacement. But out in the open ocean, you wouldn't notice these waves. They may only be a foot or two or three or four high. You know, a four foot wave here on an inland lake would seem pretty big, but if you've been out on the ocean, lots of waves bigger than four feet. But a tsunami may only be that big. So with all the other waves that are out on the ocean, you might not even see this go past. And the other thing that's really interesting about tsunamis is that they are really fast, ridiculously fast. 450, 500, even up to 600 miles an hour out in the open ocean. And they're very long waves. You know, if you've been out on waves on lakes, it's only a few feet to a couple meters between the crests of waves. Out on the open ocean, you might get tens of feet, 20, 30 feet between the crests of waves. The waves that are formed by land displacement, tsunamis, can be extremely long, miles long, between crests and troughs. And because of all this power and speed, they can travel great distances. Hawaii has been hit several times in its history by tsunamis that have originated far away in the Pacific Ocean. The Great Alaska Earthquake of 1964 sent the tsunami into Hawaii. There was one in 1946 from Alaska that sent the tsunami into Hawaii. There's been some from Japan that have sent tsunamis into Hawaii. Hawaii, because of its placement in the Pacific Ocean, gets hit by tsunamis fairly frequently. It's a big part of their history. But tsunamis can travel even farther. Back in 2011, there was a large tsunami that occurred in Japan, but that same tsunami traveled the entire course of the Pacific Ocean and ended up in South America almost 24 hours later, traveling at 400 miles an hour and affected people completely across the ocean. The other thing is we talked just a second ago about how out in the open ocean, the distances between the crests of the waves can be miles across. So the wave length 
is really long and it's really fast but as it comes towards shore it starts to feel the shore and the leading edge of that wave is going to feel the shore first and it's going to slow down first while the rest of the wave behind keeps motoring along at a really fast speed so if the front of your wave slows down and the back of the wave keeps humming along the wave compresses it gets shorter the result is that the wave adjusts by getting much taller and for that reason these come in like walls of water but not in the way that you're probably used to seeing them depicted in cartoons they're more of a big surge of water you might not even notice it sometimes you don't even see waves with tsunamis all that happens is the water just rises and it might rise over 15 or 20 minutes and it rises sort of relentlessly i've got some video that i'm going to show in a few minutes and it takes a little time to get through the video it's a bit like watching grass grow because the water rises so slow you never actually see the wave but it just keeps coming and coming and coming and then it starts going over landmarks and bridges and roadways and starts carrying cars away and at no point do you see a wave it's just a rise gradually of this water and it depends on the shape of the ocean floor near the shoreline sometimes you do get waves sometimes you get some impressive waves you don't get waves that are stories tall typically but you'll see them come in um, and they might not even look that big they may only look five or six feet high but they're on top of an even greater swell of water and like i said i'll show you some videos here in a second that i think illustrate that pretty well the other thing about tsunamis is they cause fatalities. And again, this is usually not a wall of water that just rushes in rapidly. It's more of a slow rise over tens of minutes. And what typically happens is people that die are the ones that run down to the ocean to see it. They hear a tsunami warning, which we now have set up in most of the world's ocean basins. They know a tsunami's coming and they wanna see it. It's like patting the bear at Yellowstone, right? Everybody wants to get up close and personal to these things that really can hurt them. A lot of fatalities are caused by people who are doing something they probably shouldn't do. It doesn't seem like the water's coming up that fast, but it's relentless. And once it does break through dams and break walls and structures, the water can move much faster than people anticipate. And these things can kill. Back in 1946, a tsunami that originated up in Alaska killed 159 people in Hilo, Hawaii on a perfectly calm, clear morning. We didn't have a warning system set up then. People really had no idea this was coming. Hilo is a harbor town, so it's right on the uh, ocean front, and is, just because of its orientation, is particularly susceptible to tsunamis. They've had several that have hit Hilo, and several of these have resulted in deaths. And I think last class I mentioned that I haven't been in a tsunami, but I've been in a tsunami warning. The tsunami warning was in Hilo, Hawaii. So I took it seriously. The people in Hilo take it seriously. Nothing actually happened that day, thankfully, but it's certainly something that's on the minds of the residents that live there. There was one in 1998. Papua New Guinea, which is a series of islands in the South Pacific, killed 3,000. But by far the worst on record happened back in 2004 in Indonesia. Really large magnitude, seven to eight earthquake right offshore, only uh, 50, 60 miles offshore. And that's part of the problem. A lot of times these big earthquakes occur at subduction zones. Remember subduction zones are where ocean plate is dropping beneath continental plate. So these are areas that are right on the edge of the continent, really close to the edge of the continent. First week of class, we talked about population. Where do people live? Most people live along coastlines. So this is a hazard that originates right where a lot of people live. And the focus of the earthquake may only be 
50, 60, 70 miles offshore. Sounds like a lot, you know, sounds far, right? 50, 60, 70 miles. How fast do these waves travel? 450 to 500 miles an hour. So we're basically talking about minutes. So these people that lived along the coast, first thing is that they had to endure a magnitude seven to eight earthquake. That's no small matter in itself. And just as they're done shaking, they literally only have minutes before the tsunami hits them. So it's the worst double whammy that you can get in terms of hazards. A big earthquake, and if you survive that, okay, you've got a wall of water that's coming at 500 miles an hour, and really you only have five to 15 minutes to prepare for the onslaught of this second part of the uh, hazard. Because we've had some really deadly tsunamis in the past, we've set up warning systems. Now we don't have warning systems in every ocean basin, which is a bit of a problem. We do have one in the Pacific, which was largely stemmed from what happened back in 1946 in Hilo with the 159 deaths. We set up an early warning system for tsunamis in the Pacific, but that didn't extend to the Atlantic, or to the Indian Ocean or to the Southern Ocean. In fact, one of the problems with the 2004 Indonesian earthquake and tsunami is that there wasn't a warning system set up for the Indian Ocean. A lot of people died because they weren't warned. Some people died several thousand miles away in Africa because there wasn't a warning system and because these waves can travel such great distances. So tsunamis, what do they really look like? I'm gonna show you some video. You've seen renditions, walls of water coming in, chasing people, sharks poking their heads out. No, they don't look like that. Giant waves that tower above cities and form these impressive pipes. No, they don't look like that either. I will try to show you now a couple of videos that really depict what these things look like. Sometimes you'll see waves, sometimes you won't. And what it might seem a little boring at first, and that's part of the goal I have here, is for you to see why people die during these things, why they get lulled into running up and watching these. It's because a lot of times they don't happen super quick. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they take minutes, tens of minutes, up to an hour to fully show their strength. So I'm gonna cue these up. Of course, it's gonna take me a minute because nothing is working right today, but I will get this done. So just bear with me. Okay, do you guys have any questions after seeing the videos? Yeah. Where do tsunamis, where does the idea that tsunamis are a big wall of water come from? Part of it is trying to explain to people who have never seen a tsunami what it's like. 
And that's really difficult. Just based on what you've seen, they're really different from place to place, aren't they? Sometimes you see a wave come in. Sometimes you don't see any wave at all. And, I mean, how would you describe a tsunami to somebody after what you've seen? You know, it's, it's difficult, right? It's hard to really put together a story or description that kind of encapsulates all the different ways that these can behave. So sometimes they do behave kind of like a wall of water, just in the sense that the water level just keeps rising. But it's not a vertical wall that just sort of comes in. It's a slow rise and a surge that can take minutes, seconds. And then on top of it, there are waves. And some of these waves are pretty impressive. But it's just that depending on the shoreline, and the tsunami itself, they can behave and look really different from time to time and from place to place. So I think when it's so difficult to describe the observations when they're so varied, I think that leads to generalizations that are not always accurate. So I think about the only thing you really do is Take the time like you guys are doing and take a class, look at some videos, and really learn about how these things behave and go beyond the simple explanations that a lot of times we end, our, end up uh, telling one another. So tsunamis can do some crazy stuff. I used to show this photo, and students are like, I just don't understand how that can happen. And after seeing those videos, it's pretty easy to understand how a boat can end up on top of a building. It's really simple. That whole building was underwater. And that's just where the boat ended up. Yeah, I've seen uh, photos of, of ships coming to rest on a neighborhood street. That's just where they end up. When the water recedes, the bottom of the hull hits the roadway and they just stay there. So you finally return home after this devastating earthquake and tsunami, everything's a wreck and you have a ship in your front yard. And it's not easy to remove a ship that's on a city street. So yeah, these things can do some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, there's a good example right there. There is a ship in the middle of somebody's street. Can you imagine trying to clean this up? I mean, where do you even start? You know, and trying to restore services and power, and yeah, this is, this is, this is not going to be taken care of overnight. It's going to take a long time for an area like this to recover from an event um, of this magnitude. So, how do these things form? So we talked about land displacement, okay? It has to be some sort of shifting of land in the open ocean. And I think this diagram does a decent job of showing that. Remember, most of these tsunamis occur when we have large earthquakes in the ocean. And most of these large earthquakes occur along subduction zones where you have an ocean plate like we have here on the left. Remember, ocean plates are thin. And you can see the thin gray ocean lithosphere colliding with a thicker continental crust you can see the thicker gray continental crust with a magma reservoir there. And as they collide, the denser plate subducts or slips beneath the less dense plate. Now, sometimes this slipping is nice and smooth, and over time, these things subduct very nicely. And this is a slow process. Remember, plates move a few inches a year. But every once in a while, you'll get a section of the plate that'll get locked. It won't be a nice smooth slip anymore. And it gets locked. And what happens is the little lip of the continental plate gets pulled, gets start to get pulled under with the descending ocean plate. And it's solid rock, it's elastic. And the more this gets pulled under, the more stress builds up. Eventually the stress exceeds the strength and it snaps back up very suddenly and violently. And what that does is it throws the water above it upward and creates a wave that then spreads out in both directions. And notice how close this is to the shore because it's a subduction zone. And that wave's gonna travel four to 500 miles an hour. You know, if you're only 
50 miles offshore and it's traveling 500 miles an hour, it means you have six minutes. It's not much time. In fact, it's possible that the earthquake may still be shaking you. Remember, some earthquakes go on for 8, 9, 10, 12 minutes. So it's possible to sit, be in the middle of an earthquake when the tsunami actually hits. But this is the land displacement that we're talking about, usually from this snapback effect of a descending plate and an overlying plate sticking together and then suddenly failing. And then, remember, this wave of energy roars out in both directions. One's going to come crashing to shore really quick. And these waves are not particularly tall, but they're really long. They're miles long. And as they get toward shore, what this diagram is showing is that the front of the wave is slowing down, but the back is coming in just as fast as ever. That compresses the wave in order for it to remain at the same volume. That means it has to get tall. And how tall it gets and how much it compresses really depends on the configuration of the underwater topography. You'll get a different wave if it's sort of a gradual shallowing than you will if it's a sudden shallowing like you see here you'll get different styles of waves. So that's why in some areas you might not even see a wave. And in other areas you might see something that more resembles a wall of water. Or at least waves that you can physically see coming in. So the waves get bigger as the fronts of the waves slow down as they interact with the bottom. They slow down because they feel the bottom of the ocean. There's some friction there which slows it down. And the part of the wave that's still out at sea is still moving fast. So they compress and they heighten. Any questions on this so far? So this is a topographic and bathymetric map of the Hawaiian Islands. Okay, so anything that's gray is land that's above the ocean. And all the colors that you see, the reds, the yellows, the greens, the blues, the dark blues, indicate the depth of the water. Dark blue being the deepest, red being the shallowest. And so you can see the Hawaiian Islands. You've got the big island of Hawaii down here in the lower right. Maui, Lanai, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai, Nihau, all in the Hawaiian Island chain. But remember a couple classes ago when we were talking about plate tectonics? We said that back in the 50s, we started this scientific campaign of looking at our oceans and one of the things they noticed during this campaign was there were some really interesting features that sort of surrounded the Hawaiian Islands. And the one I'll have you look at is where this vertical arrow here, this red arrow pointing north, you see all those bumps that are out in the deep seafloor? If you look around, that one's really good, but you can see that same sort of topography or morphology or landform in other places. You can see that here, you can see that here, you see them all over the place. Those probably represent landslides. Giant blocks of the Hawaiian Islands that every once in a while slip off into the ocean. That's a real hazard for people that live in Hawaii is that every once in a while large sections of their islands catastrophically slip off into the ocean. If you're living there, it is a possibility. It's not a high possibility. I think the law of averages says that these sorts of large landslides happen on the order of 10,000 to every 100,000 years. Geologically, that's really fast. From a human standpoint, you probably don't have too much to worry about. But the one to really look at, you guys see Molokai here? If you look at the north shore of Molokai, you see that it's sort of perfectly straight, isn't it? And then there's this 
what appears to be some landslide material that has slipped off. In the next slide, I'm going to show you what the north side of Molokai actually looks like from the air. It's pretty impressive. That's what it looks like. You can see those vertical cliffs, right? That vertical cliff is where the land detached from the island and slipped off to sea. So the land used to extend much farther out. Molokai used to be a much bigger island, probably bigger by a third of what it is now before that one landslide happened. So it's a kind of a double, again, another double-edged hazard. Part of your island can slip off into the ocean, but as it does slip off, guess what it does to the water? It creates a tsunami from all that land displacement where it can travel then across the ocean, impact Alaska or Japan or South America or even the west coast of the United States. So most tsunamis are caused by earthquakes. Occasionally we get tsunamis that are caused by sort of these tremendous landslides that slip off into the ocean. Um, there are some volcanic islands off the coast of Europe that have done the same thing, where they've slipped into the ocean during a volcanic eruption and created a tsunami. Um, and some of these tsunamis have hit the east coast of North America before. So now places like New York, all the way down to Florida, actually have the possibility of being impacted by a tsunami. It's a very rare chance. But it can happen, especially if you get some sort of landslide into the ocean on the other side of the Atlantic. I mentioned a little earlier that we now have tsunami warning systems set up. And what typically happens is when there's a large earthquake located in a place that could potentially create a tsunami, a warning signal is given off and we have hundreds of these specialized buoys that sort of bob around out in the ocean. So they bob around all day, all night, every day, and they go up and down with the waves that are created by the wind. And those waves have a certain signature. They go up and down at a certain rate. When you have bigger winds, you get bigger waves. But these buoys can record all this wave action and they actually have some artificial intelligence um, cooked into them as well, where they can separate out the waves that are caused by wind versus a tsunami that might go by. And remember during a tsunami, this might only rise up two or three feet and then go back down. While there's waves on top of the tsunami, because there's wind blowing on that as well. But these buoys are so sensitive that it can detect those low amplitude, long wavelength tsunamis that go by. And they're pretty good at doing it. So just because you get a big earthquake in the ocean doesn't always mean you get a tsunami. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. When there is a big earthquake, we know there's a potential for a tsunami. And then we wait and see if any of these buoys actually detect it. If they do, all of the major and small cities around, in this case, the Pacific Ocean, will be notified. And then it's the responsibility of the city leaders to then send out a warning to the residents to prepare for this. We know how fast these travel. We know when the earthquake occurred. We can give people a relative window of when it might arrive. Now, most of the time, that's a good thing. People want some time to be able to prepare. Sometimes it's a bad thing because people are people. And there was, uh, during the 2011 Japan tsunami, um, that tsunami actually hit the west coast of the US. Wasn't real big, but one of the places it hit was Santa Barbara. And like I said, it wasn't a huge tsunami, but there was a surge of water and one person died. And that one person actually went down there so that he could film because that's what we do now, because we want to put stuff on YouTube and our social media pages. But this person died because he heard the warning, and rather than doing what you should do when you're warned about a tsunami is take precaution, this person decided that they wanted to take video instead, and they met their maker that way, in a very unpleasant way. 
this diagram right here shows you travel times in hours. So let's say we have an earthquake that occurs up where the white star is, off the coast of, I'm guessing that's Japan. Each of these successive lines is how far that tsunami will travel in an hour. So you can see here, by the time it gets all the way down to the Chilean coast of South America, you're looking at 23 to 24 hours later. A day later for this to show up. Even though it's traveling at 450 miles an hour, it takes about a day. That's pretty impressive. But that's how big that expanse of ocean actually is. The Pacific is a big place. Question. Why do the islands compress? I can't go back, unfortunately, but where they get shorter like that, where they get closer together, that means that the wave has slowed down, and it's probably because it's encountering shallow water, where it's slowing that part of the wave down. And waves also do this thing that we call attenuate. Attenuate means to get smaller and shorter and less speedy. So you will see the lines get a little closer together, that just means that the wave is traveling more slowly, either because it's encountering a shallow land bottom or it's attenuating. I'm not sure if this is going to work. I'm going to try. But this is going to show what happens to the waves as they cross the Pacific. So this tsunami is going to originate up in Japan. This is actually, I think, from 2011, the one we've been talking about a lot. And what's interesting is you'll see it travel across the ocean, hit shorelines, and then it actually bounces off and keeps going. These things are so powerful that just hitting the shoreline itself a lot of times doesn't completely stop them. They will bounce off the shore and head off another direction. So let's see if they're all this, if I can get it to work. There we go. So you can see that leading edge, right? Watch when it hits uh, South America. You can actually see it bounce off and then go into the Southern Ocean. And some of it goes all the way back to Japan, which would take about two days for that to happen. So by the time it gets back to, the, to Japan, it's bounced off, it's attenuated, it's not gonna be very big, but it is possible to get hit by the same tsunami twice. Back in 1883, off the coast of Indonesia, over in here, there was a large volcano called Krakatoa that collapsed into the ocean during an eruption. And it sent a tidal wave around the Southern Ocean, which is down here below Australia, sent it around the world twice. It killed 36,000 people in Thailand and Southeast Asia. First time it went around, and it actually killed a few people the second time it went around. So again, these waves are huge, powerful, long-lasting, fast, travel great distances. And for all those reasons, combined with human nature wanting to look at these things, a lot of times they can be really, really deadly. Okay. Turn the lights back on. Got one more thing for you to watch. So up to this point, we've talked about earthquakes. Remember, earthquakes occur as stress in the earth builds to the point where it breaks rocks. When rocks break, the energy of those rocks breaking are given off as seismic waves. The two most common types of waves are P waves and S waves. P waves are compressional waves, act like sound waves. I like to think of them as the sound of the earthquake. S waves travel half the speed, but start out at the same time. They have a distinct up and down motion. And then we have hazards that crop up from earthquakes. 
One hazard is aftershocks, earthquakes that follow the first break closely in time and space. Some of these aftershocks can be quite large. We talked about fire being an effective earthquake land displacement, tsunamis. So we have all these hazards that come from a process that is ongoing. We're always going to have earthquakes. Some earthquakes are going to be large. Lots of our earthquakes occur in places where lots of people live. So earthquakes are a hazard that folks have to contend with. And people die and suffer because of these earth hazards. So it would be nice if we could stop earthquakes, but we're not going to be able to do that. Okay? Earthquakes are going to do their thing. We are powerless to stop them. So if we can't stop them and they affect our lives in a negative way, I guess the next best thing is can we understand them enough that we can predict when they're going to happen? That would be great. Give people some warning so that they can take precautions. Now, some earthquakes are so big that no matter what precautions you take, they're still going to have a devastating impact. But other earthquakes, we can really reduce the death and destruction a lot if we know when they're going to happen. Sadly, geology is not at a state in its science where we're very good at this. In fact, we pretty much suck at this. We're not good with predicting earthquakes. And it's not hard to understand why. I have a little video that I think does a decent job of explaining why. And it'll take me just a second, of course, to boot this up. <laughs> 